or something that you just don't like. Because there is something that I didn't like some years ago and I managed to have it changed in my school. The barriers. The tablets. The tablets, that's right. And so what's wrong with the tablets? I Ta and the barriers. This the, right. the tablets oh keep the attention more than the person. Do you think that a lesson can only be organized with the tablets? No. Would you be able, uh, would you be ready to uh, give up pen and paper and paper books completely? This was the intention of uh, our commander. Do you think it's a good idea to organize a course without any pen and paper? <laughs> Professor, I changed my daughter's school because of that. She was yes. attending the school with too much iPads, and I changed my daughter's school because of that. So. That's right. <laughs> and so basically, I thought, in you know, order to have a paper box and a pen and paper reintroduced in my school. Because this was a decision made by a, a, pre a previous commander, not the present commander, who is a, a completely different person. But you know, in the past. Uh, no, Di Ruzio was. Uh, ah. General Di Ruzio. They said, well, we have to get rid of paper completely. But the use of a pen and paper facilitates the learning process. Yeah. Absolutely, it's demonstrated. And so if you get rid of pen and paper completely, you will slow down the learning process. Okay, this was just to introduce the subject. And then, for example, the barrier is also a problem. But uh, we also reorganize our classrooms. Normally, I'm not sitting at the teacher's desk. This was just because we had to take a picture. And so, uh, just a pose, if you want. But, uh, uh, you know, normally, okay. I, always, I, always, uh, I always stand, I'm always standing, you know, during my, uh, just, just like now. Okay, so now we can continue with the uh, presentation on andragogy. Clemente, what is andragogy? It's a learning uh, uh, address or taken by uh, others, let's Very say. Very good, that's right. By, by uh, antagonic to pedagogic. That's right. Okay, and so as Clemente said, uh, if you want to give a definition of andragogy, it's exactly uh, the art and science of, of adult learning and teaching in any forms. The most important uh, scholar of andragogy is uh, Malcolm Knowles, you will find his name in the next slide, and he's famous for uh, his uh, five assumptions about uh, adult education. Uh, all the scholars uh, dealing with uh, andragogy no, Malcolm knows. He's a point of reference for adult education. These are the five assumptions for andragogy, for adult learners. So the first assumption is very easy. Self-concept. Basically, what Malcolm knows says is, unlike children and teenagers, adult students do not want to be directed or directed by others. They want to have a say in their learning process. As a consequence, you have to involve adult students in, for example, the creation of the syllabus and also in uh, the way in which the lessons must be organized. In what way can you do that? For example, by organizing uh, um, self-assessment by means of a self-test. We make a large use of self-tests at the Italian Army Language School. You have to offer them multiple options to choose from. So what would you like to do today? We have a lesson on capital punishment, just to retrieve the example I gave you on the day before yesterday, or a lesson on UFOs. Mm -hmm. Which one would you like to do? Okay? Mm -hmm. This is the first assumption of Malcolm Knowles. The second one is uh, adult learners experience. Now, you know that uh, while a child's mind is a blank slate, this is what uh, Malcolm Knowles says, uh, you, uh, you as a teacher, blank, blank slate, tabla, tabla rasa. Slate. Slate. slate, yeah. Just like tabla rasa, tabla rasa, tabla rasa in English. You know, um, an adult's mind, on the contrary, uh, can uh, benefit from uh, um, a, a cultural baggage, as uh, already accumulated uh, a longer cultural experience, and you as a teacher can take advantage of this uh, uh, cultural experience that he has accumulated for educational purposes, obviously. And this uh, means that it is crucial to form a class with adults with a similar life experience levels. So uh, very often when we organize uh, our classes, you know, they come to the slide, they take a placement test, and then on the basis of the results that they get, they are put in a certain class. And very often, we also uh, take care of uh, their specialties. Because uh, if we put together people from different specialties, probably they don't get along very well. They are not interested in the lives of uh, their classmates. So it is often uh, very, uh, a good idea 
to create a homogeneous classes from all perspectives. Okay? Yes. So I'm also consider because I, I found also benefit to have uh, heterogeneous environment with different background, different experiences in order to learn from. This is true, but the fact is that when you have to organize a lesson and you have to choose uh, some material, sure, yeah. but if you don't share the same uh, job or the same passions, uh, you might have a little problem. This way it's much easier. Okay. Readiness to learn. And so, uh, in what sense? Uh, in other words, uh, unlike the children, uh, when you teach something to adults, they want to be able to apply uh, what they have learned to their professional life or uh, personal life immediately. So they want uh, a direct connection between uh, what they learn in the classroom and their job uh, or a personal life. Orient this is uh, probably the most important in my opinion. Then I'll give you a practical example. Um, the orientation of your lesson should be problem-centered and not subject-centered. Um, I'll just uh, make a reference to what I do. When I explain legal English to my students, I don't give them a list of legal words to memorize, for example. But uh, a few months ago, I drew inspiration from uh, an important legal case we had in Italy, which had uh, an international echo. I'm sure that you probably know Eric Pribke, oh, the Pribke case. And so we watched a video about uh, Eric Pribke from the CNN. We um, analyzed some articles, and then we uh, extracted some, sorry, uh, some terminology from uh, those uh, uh, texts and videos. So this way, I started with the question, do you think that the Pribke was responsible for the massacre of uh, the Jews and partisans in the Argentine case, or did he just follow orders? Okay, and so um, starting from the problem, we came to uh, consolidate our knowledge of uh, legal English. And so this means that uh, what you should avoid doing is uh, give them something to memorize. On the contrary, if you contextualize uh, your lesson, the chances of assimilating uh, the uh, terminology and also um, grammatical rules will increase dramatically. And then, of course, the motivation to learn will expand on this, uh, on this point later on is uh, completely different from the children and the teenagers. Uh, in adults, normally, uh, the motivation is uh, intrinsic, uh, which is genuine motivation, and uh, it's very fruitful for learning purposes. Okay? So motivation is somehow implied. Motivation is implied. We can take for granted that you are motivated. Normally you are volunteers, so you volunteer to attend the course. But we'll uh, explain, we'll expand the motivation in a few slides. Uh, Nolz make, uh, makes a final recommendation, and so he says uh, in, on, the, on the basis of what uh, we said, on the basis of the five assumptions, remember that you have to explain the reasons why specific uh, topics are being taught. So this means that uh, when you explain something, the first thing that you have to clarify is why are you explaining this subject to your students? They want to know why they are learning something. On the contrary, as you can imagine, uh, children normally um, you know, absorb what you say and they think that probably in the future what I'm learning now will be useful for some reason. Okay? With adults, uh, on the contrary, you have to uh, uh, explain why you have chosen a specific topic. It is even better if you ask them to choose a topic to discuss it during the lesson. And again, propose a task instead of promoting memorization. So don't give them a poem to memorize, because when you are 50 years old, of course, uh, uh, you are not uh, able to memorize a poem. But you know, you should start from tasks. So today we are going to discuss, as I told you before, the Primke case. It's a task. And then while performing this task, uh, establishing whether he was innocent or uh, guilty, you learn uh, the terminology. By the way, uh, just uh, to, uh, to close the brackets of Eric Pribke, uh, you would, would be amazed to, uh, to, to know that uh, he was a sentenced to life imprisonment because he killed not the 335 partisans and the Jews, but because he killed five more uh, yes. prisoners. Just for five more, because he was uh, supposed to execute 330 people and he killed five more people. And for those affected more people, he was a sentence. Otherwise, he would have been a free man immediately, according to the law that we had during the Second World War, because he just followed orders. Mm -hmm. But you know, he went to Regina Cheney to collect the prisoners. Of course, the Nazi didn't tell them that they were going to be executed. They said that we are going to move you to another prison. And so five volunteered. And of course, they didn't want the witnesses, and they killed also yeah, these uh, five people. Okay, so 
Consider the learners of wide range of backgrounds, and so, as you can see, learning materials and activities should consider different types of learning experiences, of course, and these are what we already said. You have a wide range of experiences to choose from, even with, uh, within the same uh, military specialty, they have different experiences, and you can draw inspiration from the personal lives uh, and uh, professional lives for your lessons. Allow learners to discover things for themselves. I told you that they don't want to be directed by others, and so you give them some input, and then you uh, may want them to come to some conclusions. So this is the input I gave you, and so please uh, come to some conclusions now. And uh, create a course that will meet the learners' individual needs. This is what we said. They have high expectations and want to be taught the useful things for their lives. These are um, things given by uh, Malcolm Rose. And, uh, other things to motivate the adult learners. First of all, the importance of the use of humor. Uh, we should not underestimate humor. Humor, uh, if, it, if it is used in the right doses, of course, at the right time, in the right place, is a, a very powerful tool for teaching purposes. And as you can read here, very often it may help you diffuse stressful situations. I remember, for example, uh, one day after the progress test, some students uh, felt that they didn't, didn't, do, uh, they didn't pass it. And so they were quite frustrated. And with the use of humor, uh, they uh, regained uh, self-esteem. They, they regained the courage. Okay? Chunk information. Uh, if you have uh, longer pieces of information, you should uh, divide it into small pieces. Because the uh, easier bits are easier to process. Okay? And suspense. Don't give... Uh, of course, you have to introduce your lesson. But the typical mistake is to say everything at the beginning of the lesson. No, leave something for later on. Okay? Uh, if you think of a detective story, uh, if, uh, if you know the, the conclusion, the ending, you know, you are not motivated to read the book. Stimulate your learners and get emotional. Use uh, thought-provoking questions. Normally, I have some, yeah, I, call it, I call it emergency materials. When I realize that they are getting bored, I, uh, you know, uh, just pick up from my bag a lesson on, uh, for example, do you think there is life after death? Do you believe in UFOs? Mm -hmm. Something that you know everybody likes talking about. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, especially when the level of attention goes down. And make your lessons visually compelling. This uh, underlines uh, the importance uh, of the visual materials. Uh, we'll talk about the learning styles, uh, and you will see that uh, some people learn best when you use pictures. But remember that everybody, to a certain extent, is a visual learner. And so, uh, especially in the presence uh, of absolute beginners, uh, you should uh, use uh, uh, pictures, a lot of pictures. Get examples from the workplace, we said that before, so draw inspiration from their lives. Be respectful to them, and for example, very often, this is something that I found in my experience, you should avoid uh, the play-way method. So, not all adults like games. Uh, please do not confuse the games with the role plays. The role plays are a rehearsal of uh, you know, real-life situations. Games that could be a little bit childish, for example, especially in the presence of generals, you have to be uh, very careful. They are very, uh, very professional and very often they don't like games. They have a feeling that they are wasting their time, so uh, you have to perceive... Well, they, they fear to fail. To fail uh, in the game, that's right. So, <laughs> this is also possible, absolutely. Ask for feedback. Uh, feedback is important uh, for uh, different reasons. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, you can uh, adjust uh, your lessons on the basis of the feedback. And what is even more important is that you have to demonstrate that you take the feedback into serious consideration. So on the basis of Michele's feedback, I'm going to change my lesson and we can make these amendments, for example. Present the benefits of undertaking the course. For a language school, it doesn't take much. So uh, you know that uh, being able to learn a foreign language is obviously useful. And uh, uh, with all courses, you have to underline the reasons why uh, you know, this course will be useful for your future. And let the learning occur through mistakes. And this is uh, probably one of the most important uh, um, tips. And in particular, uh, you should avoid dealing with the mistakes in a punitive way. Mistakes, on the contrary, um, give you, uh, especially errors. We see the difference between the errors and mistakes. Uh, next, uh, next slide. Mistakes that give you um, some indications about uh, what the linguists call uh, transitional competence. So I know what the uh, current uh, limitations, the current flaws of this student are. And so you have to be able uh, to exploit the mistakes for educational purposes. So they give you indications about uh, what the student knows and what he doesn't know. 
Okay? Yes? <laughs> Just a very small comment on the last one. Right. I'm laughing now, but I wasn't laughing <clears throat> back then. Um, like a few years ago, I was taking like Persian classes, and the teacher was after. So, Whenever I was mispronouncing something or whenever my grandma was a bit off, he would just burst out laughing. And it's like, you're not a child, right? So I'm, I'm not that years old and you laugh at me because my pronunciation is not good. It lasted two months. That was, that was the end of my classes. But, That's right. you know, it's, it, you feel really like diminished. Absolutely. Because, you know, you're making an effort, the guy's there to teach exactly. you. But it allows you any time you don't say something like correctly. Absolutely. I think that an experienced teacher never laughs at mistakes, never. On the contrary, uh, he reminds us that uh, when, the, when a student makes a mistake, it's a 50% of his fault. And so uh, there's no reason uh, to, to laugh at it, absolutely. I agree with you entirely. Yeah. I want and so to make an example as well. May I? <laughs> when I was learning French, uh, my second teacher, uh, I abandoned the school. Because she didn't uh, set any humor in class at all. Oh, okay. And then okay. the okay. teacher I took, uh, and she loved me because I was making jokes all the time. Yeah, the only thing is uh, uh, the use of humor should be the right doses. It's not directed to you anymore. Right, okay. So now. Definition of uh, errors and mistakes. In linguistics, uh, there is a difference between uh, errors and mistakes. Uh, the, the difference is very easy. Uh, errors are deviations that are competence-based. So you don't know a rule, you don't know a grammatical rule, you don't know that, for example, uh, you mean the DS for the third person singular, and so it's an error, you don't know it. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, in, in the presence of uh, errors, uh, the teacher should intervene. Otherwise, uh, if he or she doesn't, the student may have the, the feeling that it's correct to uh, not to put the S of the person, the person sigma. And, on the contrary, a mistake is uh, uh, a performance uh, deviation. And so, for example, you're tired, so you don't put the S for the third person sigma, even if you know that uh, the third person sigma needs the S. And in this case, so in the presence of mistakes, it is often a good idea to lead the student to correct himself. So you have to lead him to self-correction, okay? Because otherwise he feels frustrated. So you, you uh, can just ask him to repeat. Can you please repeat? And so, uh, and then, of course, uh, when he corrects himself, he won't feel any frustration. And so, as I told you before, errors can give information about the learner's transition of competence, okay? I know what your current flaws your current limits are, and I can act accordingly, okay? Some differences between youth and uh, adult learners, uh, for example, the first difference is the age. You know that the age of variation in a, an adult class is quite huge, it's quite wide, and so you can have people in their 20s and some others in their 50s, and of course there could be a generation gap and you have to uh, fill it in, you as a teacher, okay? Another one is uh, uh, the, uh, an adult class that may comprise the learners with a different previous education, different qualifications. And, you know, for example, in some cases uh, we have uh, classes in which some officers are not familiar with grammar, advanced grammar, with the syntax. So if you have to explain the future and past, and they don't have uh, a clear idea of the present conditional and the past conditional, you can have a problem. And, uh, of course, uh, when dealing with adults, adults uh, have also other priorities. The school is, uh, you know, an important uh, priority, but there are, there are also others, and you have to take it uh, into consideration. And, uh, as a consequence, uh, the attendance of uh, um, adult students may fluctuate. You have to get ready for uh, very, from, very uh, frequent absences from class, okay? Some differences between uh, uh, youth and adult learners, so for example, uh, I think we discussed it informally uh, a few days ago, the relation between uh, the, the student and the teacher. Now, normally, in a class of uh, children or teenagers, uh, this relationship is asymmetrical. And so, because, uh, uh, as I told you, um, these teenagers know that what they learn uh, is uh, from a source, from a, uh, an authority, and they have to respect the authority, and they know that uh, sooner or later this knowledge will be useful. On the contrary, uh, with uh, adult students, in some cases, uh, this relationship is immediately symmetrical. But very often, uh, there is the so-called infantilization um, phenomenon. So in other words, in the presence uh, of, uh, of the teacher, some adult students 
feel that uh, their knowledge is inferior, and so they, uh, they act uh, just like uh, a child towards uh, his or her pa uh, parents. And it is the teacher's responsibility to act in such a way that uh, this relationship uh, becomes uh, symmetrical. Uh, by calling them uh, by first names, there are many, uh, many uh, strategies, but the most important one is to make them uh, responsible for their mistakes and their successes. So when they make a mistake, they have to feel that 50% of the blame should be cast on themselves. So making them responsible is a good uh, strategy uh, to guarantee this uh, symmetrical relationship okay, with, uh, uh, with the students. The application of learning, of course, um, why for uh, young learners uh, this application will be in the future for uh, uh, you know, um, adult students uh, there must be an immediate application, we said that before and also in the program development, in the syllabus development remember to uh, involve your students so uh, the syllabus at the SLE, at the Italian Army Language School is very flexible so the only um, fixed points of the syllabus are the grammatical ones so grammar has to be dealt with but all the rest all the topics that we choose, all the geopolitical subjects, are chosen in class. So what would you like to discuss today and tomorrow? Okay? And so it's a, a contribution uh, between uh, the teacher and the students. Uh, another difference is that, of course, uh, young students uh, learn because they want to pass exams, and on the contrary, uh, um, adult students just want to acquire a new competence. So these are important uh, differences. How can you make sure that uh, learning is effective? So what must you do in practice in the classroom to make sure that uh, uh, what you teach is uh, assimilated, is uh, acquired by your students? Uh, according to Lewis, um, learning is effective if uh, it takes into consideration two orders, they, they call them orders. The first one is the logical order of the discipline. So in other words, when you explain a rule, you have to make sure that uh, the position for that topic in that particular um, let's say, <coughs> syllabus is the correct one. So, just to make a long story short, you can't explain the present perfect continuous if you have not explained the present perfect simple. You must uh, proceed by levels of complexity, obviously. And then there is uh, something uh, even more important. It is uh, the, the learner's uh, psychological order. What does it mean? It means that uh, you have to take into consideration their learning styles. Uh, each one of us has a one or more predominant uh, learning styles. What is a learning style? The way in which we prefer to study. So you feel comfortable, for example, uh, reading. You learn better when you read a text, or you learn better when you watch a movie. And so uh, it is important for the, uh, for the teacher to take into consideration different learning styles. This is the official definition of a learning style. So, a learning style is the preferential way in which the student comprehends, processes, and retains information. The concept of a learning style is very flexible. This means that you can have one predominant learning style. You may be a verbal student or a, a visual student, but uh, some students have uh, more than one predominant learning style. And uh, you can even develop new learning styles as you proceed in, uh, in, in your, uh, for example, learning path. And so, um, what, can, what are the, some tips for, for the teachers? Of, of course, you have to try, you have to identify the learning styles in your students. So you have to uh, communicate with them, obviously, in order to understand what their predominant learning styles are. And then, of course, you have to accommodate the predominant learning styles of all of them. A mistake that uh, the teacher should avoid making is uh, trying to impose uh, his or her own learning style on his or her own students. For example, if you as a teacher uh, have a predominant verbal learning style, you expect your students to have the same predominant learning style. This is wrong, obviously. So you have to adapt your teaching to your students' predominant learning styles, and not vice versa. Okay? These are the seven learning styles recognized by, uh, I think, psychology, not, not, uh, not necessarily linguistics. The learning style may be visual, also called spatial. So this means that you prefer you learn best when you use pictures. It can also be oral or auditory musical. You like uh, learning uh, by using songs, music. It could be verbal, if you like, for example, listening to audio or speaking. Physical or kinesthetic. Uh, if you prefer to um, use your body, for example, think of role play. You, you learn better if you participate in role plays, for example. 
uh, to be logical, mathematical, so if you like the reasoning, if you like numbers, uh, social or interpersonal, you learn best when you work in groups, or solitary or intrapersonal, you prefer to work alone, you prefer to study uh, without uh, your, um, your classmates. It's also important to remember that uh, you can be an analytical student or a global student. Uh, these are two different approaches that we have uh, towards the knowledge in general. So some people prefer to start from a general picture of the situation and after they analyze the single details. And so this means that uh, they have a global vision of a, a global approach to teaching. They consider the subject as a whole, so they concentrate on the entire forest and not only the single trees. And so they use an inductive approach, which is very useful for uh, learning purposes. Other students are analytical. So they are, uh, I am analytical, for example. When I uh, study something, I like to proceed one step at a time. I know that uh, this would be quite uh, you know, uh, time consuming, but you know, if I have to get ready for, uh, for something, I like to explore the single details. I really envy those students uh, uh, who are uh, global, but you know, it's, it's a question of predominant learning style. I'm analytical. And so I prefer to concentrate on the single trees of the forest instead of seeing the forest as a whole. So the, the general view, the general picture of the situation, in my, in my case, uh, is the conclusion, not the start. Okay? May I say something? Yes. Uh, in general, who is uh, analytical starts later, but uh, is more focused, and in general, uh, is the learner who will succeed. Yes, I think so, because uh, for obvious reasons, because you will know all the details of the subject. If you're a global student, a lot of minor details will be neglected. I agree with you, yes. Professor, this, is that Pasquale? Uh, Pasquale, sorry, is yeah. that any... Okay, got this point in discussion, but does the situation, the specific situation at hand, has a role or has something to say about this? I mean, I'm sure there are situations where analytical, an analytical person will have a bigger tendency to succeed, but I'm sure there are other situations where the global vision about what's going on, even if not in such a detail, is more, uh, uh, should be the, 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 the one. Thank you very much for your question. I think that uh, this, uh, this reminds me of a personal experience. I had uh, two students. One was, in my opinion, analytical, another one was uh, global. And we had to, uh, to study a subject, and they, they were supposed to give a presentation about that particular topic. Now, the uh, global student was more effective in the sense that uh, he was also more courageous. Even if he didn't have the words, he didn't have the terminology, he, he just you know, uh, started speaking and uh, it was uh, quite hard to interrupt him. The other student took a much longer time to get ready, but in the end, when they gave the presentations, the analytical student was almost perfect. He didn't make any mistakes. He knew the correct words to be used in a particular topic, while the global student, in the presence of uh, people who were very good uh, English speakers, didn't cut a good, uh, a good figure. Probably uh, was a little bit uh, limping. And so I think that in the end, it all depends on your target, but if your target uh, should be based on uh, precision, if you want to make a good impression, probably an analytical approach would uh, increase the levels of uh, success, of succeeding. This is what uh, I personally found, but it all depends on the context, obviously. In an informal context, on the contrary, a global approach to learning may be more effective. It all depends on the level of precision, in my opinion. So let's uh, um, put it this way. If you want to guarantee a, a result that is as accurate as possible, you should be analytical. If a general overview of the situation is enough, a global approach is to be preferred. Sorry for, for the dialogue. Sure. Uh, my question was not so related to this uh, learning environment, school environment, but in the military mean, okay, in the military uh, area, or in the military experiences in life, most of the decisions we are forced to take are in the absence of accurate information. That's right. In that case, the global okay. approach and is And I have faster. seen many times in my life people that are so analytical that are blocked because they don't have all the information they need to make the decision. Perfect. And, yeah, I got it. and okay, and this kind of dynamic movement and things happening very quickly and changing, sometimes what you need is shades. Right. That guide you and you have to make a decision. Absolutely. Well, in a context like that, uh, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely, you're right. It all depends on the particular situation. 
But in the military context, if you don't have the information, you can't be analytical. You have to act immediately, and so you have to make do with what you have. Absolutely. Thank you for your information. To the limitation of the system, yeah. the analytical system has more, much more limitation, first of all, the time. If you don't exactly. have time available, that over approach would be preferred yes. because you don't have so much time. That's Absolutely. Actually. In fact, for example, uh, um, the analytical approach and the global approach are related to uh, two uh, teaching methods. You said the uh, deductive teaching method and the inductive teaching method. Now let's take a look at it. May, may I? Sure. But for instance, when you learn a foreign language, it's better a global student than a, a, a analytical student. Because how can you analytical learning? Uh, exactly. Uh, let's say that normally you start in a global way. But then, for example, if you go back to uh, the, the lesson I mentioned about uh, any picture, so we started uh, having a conversation about this topic, and later on we extracted the words from, uh, from the articles. Of course, the start was global, but in the end, you must become analytical, because I want you to memorize the correct words to be used. I want you to know that statute of limitations on murder means that legis sulla prescrizione sul omicidio, for example or uh, many other expressions like that. So in the end, this is the target. I want you to memorize the few expressions related to legal English. Okay. So the, the result must be analytical. Okay, so we have uh, verbal learners and uh, um, visual learners. We know uh, who they are. These are the most important uh, um, learning styles. And so uh, while the others uh, may not be present in the classroom, you can be sure that uh, these two uh, learning styles are always present in the classroom. And so it is often a good idea for the teachers to use both approaches to teaching and learning, okay? Uh, everyone learns better when information is presented both visually and verbally. Now let's talk about psychopsychology, also called educational psychology. And uh, the main uh, target of uh, educational psychology is the motivation. How to activate motivation in your students in this case. And uh, what is uh, even more important, uh, how to maintain motivation in, uh, in your students. And first of all, we have uh, two types of motivation. We have uh, extrinsic, the extrinsic motivation, that is, uh, for example, when what is important uh, is uh, the reward or the fear of punishment. Okay, so you want, for example, you study because you don't want to be reprimanded by your teacher. Okay, or because you want to pass the exam. And, uh, um, for, or uh, if you think of, uh, of a sport, you uh, participate in a sport because you want to win. Okay, it's extrinsic. Intrinsic motivation, on the contrary, is when you are motivated uh, to, to do something because you like it. You enjoy, uh, for example, a sport activity. It's not important whether you win the match or not, but you want to do it because you, you like the activity. And uh, of course, uh, intrinsic motivation is uh, uh, much more fruitful, uh, fruitful for uh, educational purposes. In extrinsic motivation, you, uh, achieve, you want to achieve uh, performance objectives. So this means that the reward uh, that you will receive uh, is more important than the new competence that you will acquire. And in these cases, uh, any failure may lead to frustration and demotivation. So if you don't pass the exam, you will feel frustrated if your motivation is extrinsic. On the contrary, if you are uh, pushed, if you are moved by intrinsic motivation, you want to achieve mastery objectives. You want to learn a new language because uh, you want to be able to speak it. And so you like uh, the fact that you will master a new language. doesn't matter if you will not pass the exam. Okay? And in this case, uh, of course, the, the competence is more important than the reward. And in these cases, any failure will be a stimulus to work harder. We discussed it this morning, if you remember, okay? Uh, you have to pay attention to uh, avoid this uh, so-called over-justification effect. In other words, if you realize that uh, a student is already highly motivated intrinsically, don't give him or her too many rewards. Otherwise, he will lose interest in, uh, in, the, in the activity. Because uh, whenever he does something, he wants a reward. It's like the dog. Exactly, <laughs> just like dogs. So, characteristics of motivating tasks. That's why you never say bravo to all of us. <laughs> all right. So, uh, how can we make sure that uh, the tasks that uh, we give to our students are perceived as motivating? So, what are the characteristics that would make a task motivating and not frustrating? Now, the first thing is uh, the task must be slightly challenging. 
Uh, there is a, a linguist, Stephen Krushen is his name, and uh, he uses a sort of a mathematical equation. He says that uh, input equals input plus one, not the input plus a hundred. So this means that uh, when you uh, give uh, some information to your student, you must not exaggerate in the amount of information. It must be in the right size, in the right quantity. The same, uh, in other words, uh, don't overload or underload your students. Make sure that uh, the quantity of information you give them is the right one. Otherwise, you know, they, they may feel that it's too much or it's too little. Then, of course, what you say should be relevant to their lives. So, if you want your class to be motivating, we said that before, don't talk about, for example, uh, I remember that uh, just go for, uh, you know, for joking. I, 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 uh, one day I came to my class and said, okay, uh, guys, today's lesson is going to be about the transition from classicism to romanticism, mm -hmm. to a class of soldiers. Imagine the motivation, imagine the enthusiasm. Of course, I was joking, okay? So you have to choose a topic that uh, is relevant to their lives. And allow the student to work autonomously. And so, in other words, they don't want to be, uh, let's say, directed by others. And so it's important that they feel that they have a say in their learning process. And they must be able to uh, um, uh, choose from a selection of options and so on and so forth. And this is particularly important. Uh, remember that uh, the final exam should not be perceived as a, as a threat. Okay? The final exam should be presented as a, as a normal phase of the learning process. And so in what way can you um, uh, create a distrust in your students about the final exam? By rehearsing the final exam. So by having uh, mock tests in class. Okay? So it's important that the final exam is not perceived as an obstacle that is impossible to overcome. These are the two uh, most important approaches to learning. Uh, the approach can be didactic or inductive. The inductive approach is much better, but it's much more time consuming. And you will see that the inductive approach is not a recent discovery. It was uh, uh, discovered, it was understood if you want, by Socrates uh, 400 years before Christ. And what is the didactive approach? The didactive approach is a typical case in which the, student, the, the teacher explains a rule and then asks his or her students to uh, do exercises with this grammatical rule. And so there is an explanation and then the application of uh, what the teacher explained. And uh, this uh, didactive approach should not be considered completely negative. Because there are cases in which explaining rules in this way may be very beneficial. Imagine a situation in which you have to explain a law, the articles of a law. Of course, the approach should be uh, deductive. In other cases, uh, it's preferable to use an inductive approach. And what is the inductive approach? Imagine a situation, again, in which you have to explain um, a verb tense. Instead of explaining the grammatical rule, instead of explaining verbally the, uh, the use of the verb tense, you present, for example, uh, 10 sentences containing uh, that particular verb tense. And then you ask your students to compare those sentences and come to uh, a conclusion. So what is the rule to use this particular verb tense, in your opinion? By comparing these sentences, for example, you are studying the present perfect and you give them 10 sentences with the present perfect and another 10 with the past simple. So they compare these expressions and they come to know when they are supposed to use the past simple or the present perfect. Okay, so without um, a verbal explanation. As I told you, uh, the inductive approach draws inspiration from Socrates and uh, he had a method, the so-called Socratic method or a maiutic. And uh, basically, um, so maiutic uh, comes from uh, uh, midwifery. Uh, today we would call a midwife an obstetrician. Uh, Socrates uh, said that uh, learning is just like uh, the act for, for a woman to deliver a baby. And so um, the teacher has to uh, help the student bring out of his mind the truth, the knowledge which is already in his mind. And so, uh, in what way? By reasoning and dialogue. So don't give, uh, for example, the solution to a problem, just uh, give your students the input, make, make him uh, use his mind in order to come to a conclusion. And so this is called the uh, maiutic method. And if you think, even the verb educate has a, is a concept uh, you know, in uh, the etymology. It comes from ex duce, so bring out, tirare fuori, in Italian. 
So, uh, by asking questions, uh, asking questions is a method of learning, so giving birth to the truth. And for example, the quotation is uh, self-explanatory. I cannot teach anybody anything, I can only make them think, is what Socrates said. Which approach is better? It all depends on what you want to uh, achieve. For example, if the information must be predictable, because you need uh, to uh, explain, as I told you before, a list of articles, well, the detective approach is, uh, is much better. The contrary, if uh, you uh, want to achieve a, a deep uh, rate of understanding, uh, so if uh, a rate of retention, a greater rate of retention is uh, desired, then, of course, you have to make use of the uh, inductive approach. It, it also depends on the time available. If you don't have much time at your disposal, you have to use the deductive approach. So one approach does not exclude the other. They are complementary, okay? Language learning and language acquisition. Now, I have to make a long story short. I realize that we are running out of time. Can you tell me when uh, we only have uh, five minutes uh, available? Okay. And uh, uh, what is the, language, uh, the difference between the language learning and the language acquisition? It's very easy. Uh, in other words, imagine that uh, you have to, uh, the, the teacher explains a grammatical rule. You understand it. This is a language learning. You have understood the rule. You have used your logic and you have understood the rule. Uh, if you acquire the rule, so language acquisition, if you acquire the rule, it means that not only did you understand the rule, but you're also able to reuse it spontaneously. It becomes an integral part of your cultural baggage. This is a language acquisition. It's the same uh, process that, for example, by which a child learns a language. Nobody explains a grammar to a child. Okay? He uses an inductive method, so he acquires the language by using an inductive method. How do we memorize? How do we learn? Uh, when we learn, we have to consider the short-term memory and the long-term memory. And so, basically, this is uh, uh, closely related to the difference between uh, language learning and language acquisition. Uh, the first process of memorization involves the short-term memory. This means that uh, using your logic, you understand something. So you have to learn something. You know that for the third person singular, you need the yes. Then, uh, what is important is that uh, this information uh, must move from the short-term memory to the long-term memory. So you must acquire the information. And how do you do that? So why is it, this is important. The short-term memory can only store limited amounts of information. If you want to uh, draw a comparison with a computer, uh, the short-term memory is uh, similar to the REM, okay? You know, the volatile memory. When you switch off the computer, the information goes away. On the contrary, the long-term memory is the ROM, uh, the hard disk, if you want, okay? It's a store of the hard disk. And uh, uh, information must first pass uh, through the short-term memory before it can be stored as a long-term memory. You learn through the short-term memory using logic. You acquire language acquisition through your long-term memory. So you become capable of uh, reusing the information. Questions? Okay. You move information from the short to the long-term memory by using the consolidation process. And here, there is something that I found quite uh, uh, say amazing. Because, uh, uh, for example, think of a mechanical repetition. I think that uh, for years we have said that the mechanical repetition does not work. No, it works. It does work. And the demonstration is, I'm sure that uh, many of you still remember some poems uh, that you memorized when you were children. So they have uh, rediscovered, the linguists have rediscovered the importance of a mechanical repetition in learning, in learning a foreign language. Or uh, there is also the second method, is a meaningful association. Another context in which uh, language acquisition is uh, favored is, uh, is when uh, the, word that, uh, the new word that you, you encounter is in a meaningful context. You need that word in, a, in an emergency situation, for example. And there are good chances that you will remember that word for the rest of your life because of the context that helped you memorize that piece of information. This is the reason why uh, the explanation of grammatical rules should always uh, be contextualized. Uh, so you have to make references to particular situations when you explain grammar. It should never be explained as a something isolated from the context. All right. So uh, about the um, uh, rehearsal or repetition method, the more the information is repeated or used, the more likely it is for, uh, for it to eventually move to the long-term memory. 
And this is taken from the Oxford Advanced Learners Dictionary, from the introduction. Uh, you need to notice and focus on new words between 6 to 20 times before they really become part of your vocabulary. So the more you find a word, the more likely it is for you uh, to acquire that new word. Or there is a second method. You need to see a word 160 times in 40 minutes. And then you acquire it. You can, uh, you can do this experiment. Is it working? I think so. I think so. Uh, try to read a sentence containing a word. So uh, um, uh, the context is, uh, is uh, absolutely necessary. You have to use a sentence, not a single word. Read it. Uh, uh, 160 times in 14 minutes, and you will remember the new word for the rest of your life. This is what they say. <laughs> Meaningful association, I told you before, uh, it's important to use a context that will facilitate, of course, understanding the understanding of a particular word, or even better, if, uh, for example, you, uh, you are in the middle of a conversation and you find a new word, the chances of remembering the, the new word will increase dramatically out of context, out of the classroom in some cases. Uh, it's a, a quotation from Stephen Crusher again, a language is best acquired in real life situations when the learner forgets that he or she is learning a foreign language and concentrates on the pragmatic context of the communicative interaction that he or she is involved in. So in other words, uh, uh, if the context is a meaningful, the chances of remembering the words uh, will be much uh, many. Long-term memory is often the mind, this is just to complete the subject of um, memory. Uh, if you think of long-term memory, you have to distinguish the declarative memory from the procedural memory. Now, what, what's the difference?